ஓம் சார் வணக்கம் நமஸ்தே நமஸ்காரம் அஸ்லாம் வணக்கம் சன் போனி ஈஞ்சா இ கம நாமி கிங்கு கொண்டிசி செல்வன் நைட் ஸ்காலர்ஸ் <laughs> from the Banaras Hindu University, Professors Ganesham and Ashutosh Kumar. The 1860 Heritage Center is a museum and as its name suggests, focuses on the telling, archiving and the recording of the story of invention. The reading, writing and telling of the story of invention cannot be complete without paying tribute to the work of Professor Surendra Banaji. As the director of the 1860 Heritage Center, my telling of the 1860 indenture worker journey has taken on a deeper personal meaning for, for my children and my family and from the 1st of june this year i was able to trace my indenture ancestry to an indenture number 3297 listed as passenger named kamachi no surname kamachi kamachi was what was listed on the ship's list who arrived to South Africa on board the Saxon in 1864. The access to tracking down this vital information is due entirely to the tireless work of Professor Surendra Bhana and Professor Joel Bray. Their work moves my great, great party, Kamaji, from the margins of subaltern sub history to the very center of my existence as a proud South African of indentured origins. My dress today, is not a show of ethnic pageantry no in tribute to scottish or chatswood <laughs> tamil masculinity no i said chatswood tamil masculinity uh. this working class garment a pajama which is what it's called i have worn on the occasion of every surendra bana lecture to pay a respectful tribute to the indian workers who arrived on 384 ships to their african homes between 1860 and 1911 as the 1860 heritage center we are proud today to present one of the brightest stars in telling the history of indenture in ashutosh kumar to deliver the surrender bana memorial lecture ashutosh's seminal work titled colonies of the empire indentured indians in the sugar colonies 1830 to 1920 pioneers new ground in the decolonial in indenture history telling In but one chapter Kumar writes of the experience of indenture through the analysis of folks offering fresh insight that previous scholars of indenture have ignored. Beyond this book as Ashutosh's analysis on feeding the Gilmita the food and drink on indenture indenture chips offers unique and fresh scholarship in understanding the finer details that tour of my Kamach of the travel conditions of the nature me come and come professor ashutosh kumar in taking up this opportunity to deliver the surrender bana memorial lecture i welcome to the podium the chairperson of the 1860 heritage center's history society professor jera bredi to chair the session of the apartheid. And for academics, 
It was a difficult time in this country. And Suresh Prana was one of those people who spoke his mind. And I remember in Senate meetings, it was a voice to be reckoned with, and a rather compelling voice for academia and for politics in general. And as you can imagine, the hierarchy at that time in control, you know, of UDW, people like Olafir and Freddie, didn't take very kindly to Suresh Prana. And I think when academics find that they are constrained and they can't carry out the academic work to the fulfillment, they sometimes leave. We simply have to respect that. And as you know, after he left us, he became you know, Professor of History at the University of Kansas. And I think the army stayed there until he retired in 2016, and then he passed away in 2017. You will hear a lot more about his contribution to history by the Ramaka speaker, and particularly in digitizing the ship's lists and opening up a whole new business for research in that field. And he also paid tribute to, I think we here focus very much on the indentured agents, but he wrote a book on the settlers and the dispersion of settlers and many business people, how they went out for the rest of the country. And I think that was a very important contribution. And it is interesting that, you know, after he left, his colleague and friend, Joe, uh, Joy Brain, took over his post as professor of history at, you know, the uh, University of Dirkwood. But one of the things I should say <clears throat> is that when Sir F. Barner was a professor, he brought in a lot the young new academics. And many of them graduated under him. And we have the Akopana Hirolo, who may remember, you know, the inspiration of Suresh Barna, and it put you down to see there was so much to pay on your And so, you know, he contributed in many ways uh, to academia and history in this country. But let me, with those few words, uh, introduce our speaker. And those of you who listened to me yesterday, I beg your words, I think it's important that you know people there's something about our guest speaker. Thank you, Ashish, for coming to our country. I know you had some difficulty with the visa, but I think you're settling now. He's Associate Professor of History at the Benares Hindu University in Varanasi. He had his PhD from the History Department of the University of Delhi, where he also taught from 2012 to 2014. He received a number of prestigious scholarships during his time, and he was fellow at the University of Leeds, United Kingdom, the Nehru Memorial the Museum Library in New Delhi, and the Centre of Study for Developing Societies in New Delhi. <coughs> he has published many books and articles in international peer reviewed journals. His most recent publications include Coolies of the Empire, Endangered Indians, and the Shepherd Colonies, 1830 to 1920, Cambridge University Press, the Indian Labour Diaspora, and more recently in 2017, the Grumatiars and Global Indian Diaspora, Origins, Memories, and Identities. And Professor Kumar, it's a great pleasure to have you our bits and I'll ask you now to take the way. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'm grateful to Selvan Naidu, Professor Priz Maharaj, and uh, 1860 Heritage Center for inviting me to give this annual lecture in Professor Surendra Mahana's honor. I'm truly honored. The academic writings of the late Professor Mahana have, in some ways, influenced my academic understanding and writing. As a result, I too hold this invitation in a high level. Similar to late Professor Bridge Vila, Surendra Bhana was a pioneering academic who dispelled numerous myths concerning in nature, including those related to caste, occupation, gender, areas of development, etc. In 1834, the British government in India introduced what came to be known as the endangered system. 
through which Indian laborers could go overseas to work on the sugar, sugar plantations on a fixed term contract. From 1834 to 1920, the recruitment of Indians to work on the colonial plantations of the various islands was organized through this system. The model of Indian indenture system was borrowed from a practice that originated in Europe in the 13th century, but it became a common pra practice in 17th and 18th century when European planters in the United States deputed European and Chinese laborers on their plantations. Some American planters used this policy to obtain <coughs> Chinese labor from the Portuguese settlement of Macau. Under that system, labor was recruited for the planters by their agents to work for a certain period of time, usually for five years, during which the employer was legally obliged to provide fixed wages, medical attendance, and other amenities for the laborers. After the period has elapsed, the laborers could either renew his or her terms of employment or return to his or her native land. The Indian indenture system had largely the same general terms and conditions, with only minor vari variations between the different colonies. The main feature of the Indian indenture system was that emigrants had to commit themselves to a fixed term of labor in advance by signing an agreement, popularly known as Grimit, which committed them to work for five years in their destination colony. The agreement form clearly mentioned the kind of work to be done, hours of work and remuneration, and the availability of various other facilities such as accommodation, hospital, rations, etc. The extent to which migrants were able to fully understand or planters were willing to genuinely uphold the terms of these agreements has been the subject of much debate at that time and since. Writing on indenture labor migration is almost as old as system itself. From the late 1830s, humanitarians connected with the anti-society movement raised their voices against what they deemed a new system of slavery, which simply replaced the same labor supply to sugar production in the various British colonies with another equally reprehensive form of wanted labor. As many of the ongoing debates about the nature of the nature as the system had their roots in the early 19th century response. Here, I begin with the brief survey of the contemporary reporting and writing on indenture. I will then move on to focus on the various strands in the indenture and in migration scholarship, and then I will discuss my own research on indenture from a subaltern perspective. Among the earliest writers to expose the horror of indenture was John Scoble. Scoble, a British abolitionist campaigner who visited many plantations in British Guyana during 1834 to 1840, and published his finding on the indenture system in a pamphlet titled British Guyana Facts, Facts, Facts. Scoble terms the transportation of Indian quote unquote pulleys as slave trade and contended that it was heavily based on kidnapping of ignorant and inoffensive Hindus. Scoble was one of many who spoke out against the indenture system. Others included Williams Garland Barrett, Joseph Beaumont, Edward, Edward Jenkin, who visited the various plantations of Demerara, Jamaica, and British Guyana to look into the working of the system and the life of Indian indentured workers on the plantations. These contemporary writings, amounting to only a few of, of the important pamphlets and booklets by Englishmen touring the former slave colonies of the Caribbean during 1840s to 1870, though full of local color, do not fully recognize the difference between pre-existing slave, slave based sugar plantations and one run on the indenture system. Focused mainly on West Indies colonies, 
where the culture of plantation slavery was deep rooted, it came naturally to ex slave planters to deal with the indentured Indians in a similar manner. Many of these pamphlets were a continuation of the anti slavery colony of the abolitionist and seem to have run their course by the 1870s when the indentured system became fully institu institutionalized by the colonial officials on the Indian side. On the other hand, there is a curious lacuna regarding the indenture as far as 19th century mainstream Indian political and political economic discourse is concerned. A reading of the secondary work suggests that in the anti firangi grievances and proclamations that fueled the Great Rebellion of 1857 about the loss of religion, contamination of food substances, which impure substances, aggressive missionary activities, etc. There was hardly any mention of the shiploads of Hindus and Muslims peasants that were sent to distant lands across the black waters on special indentured vessels. That was how the indentured system could have appeared in the widespread inter-religiously inflected discourse of company Raj of those times. Similarly, the issue of indenture seems to have been entirely absent in the wide-ranging economic critique of the British Raj by the early Indian nationalists. Indeed, the word indenture is absent from the classic works on the subject and its equally detailed index by famous historians such as Bipan Chandra and all. For its part, the vast colonial archives on agrarian society of North India epitomized in the massive compilation district wide settlement reports and district gazetteers dealing with land tenure, present production, and rural economy did not carve any space for the treatment of this phenomena on indentured labor from these districts. There so were columns on migration in these official compilations, but this was discussed largely within the boundaries of the India and not from the Indian overseas. That is perhaps the reason that the theme of indenture was not touched upon, even curiously, cursorily in much recent scholarship writings on rural India. Indentured labor from India did not attract much specific attention from historians until the 1970s. In 1940s and 60s, the issue was addressed primarily within the capacious fold of empire historical and in survey of Indian overseas. Here I am constant and K. Gillian were the pioneers, though they each had quite different emphasis. Camston provided the detailed analysis of the early period of emigration, deploying considerable statistical information and delineation of key events to contain that the so-called coolie trade was not only extremely expensive in terms of human life, but contributed significantly to the beggaring of the colonial treasury. He did not believe, however, that the introduction of Indian immigration affected cultural and language in any fundamental way, and further argued that the return of endangered Indians enriched with their savings, skills, and experience contributed to the rapid appearance of nationalism in India and a growing demand, of, demand for independence. Kerry Gillian works work on Fiji Indians marked a new direction to, in the historiography of labor migration from India to the colony. It was the first time that a study went beyond looking at the indenture only as a political or administrative issue. Gillian presented a balanced picture. I go, though the indenture system was temporarily surviving, but through this a new society arose with great potentialities for development for the Indian laborers. Gillian argued that indenture provided new social and economic opportunity to thousands of poor laborers who migrated from India. There was, he suggested, far more social equality in Fiji. Women had more freedom and the children were healthier. Religious divisions remained, but the degree of tolerance was remarkable, with caste becoming unimportant. According to Gillian, despite the various events of the indenture system, overall it offered an improvement 
on the conditions the Indian migrants experienced at home and at that on the whole those who went to Fiji were for the most part better off than their kin who had remained in their North Indian villages. The pivotal moment in the study of indenture came with the appearance of the new Stinker's seminal work, A New System of Slavery, published in 1974. Writing in the aftermath of the decolonization in Africa, Tinker took a liberal anti-colonial approach, took a liberal anti-colonial approach to the issue of indenture immigration that contrasted strongly with Gideon's earlier work. According to Tinker, the foundations of the indenture system were laid by the slave system that preceded it and in that sense it was itself a legacy of slavery. Tinker stressed the seaport mortality during wars, the absence of respectable family life on the plantations and the role of kidnapping and fraud in the recruitment process. For Tinker, the indenture system was a new form of slavery in all but name, which replaced the replaced now illegal previous form formal slave system. There was one factor and only one Tinker argued in which indenture differed from chattel slavery, that it involved temporary servitude rather than a permanent condition. Otherwise, indenture was an utter setback for those caught in its messes. In, this, in his assessment, Tinker was heavily influenced by the position taken by the above mentioned late 19th century humanitarians, who were the first to view indenture as approximating to slavery. These 19th century discourses on indenture were deeply embedded in the social and political context of their time. However, we are bound to a wider set of both humanitarian and commercial and imperial agendas. Though very different in their arguments and emphasis, both Gideon's and Tinker writings provided much needed momentum to the students of the history of indenture. In early 1980s, Brisvilla studies brought a new dimension to the historiography of indenture and and effectively destroy stereotype about the indentured Indians. Now, the grandson of an indentured laborer and Gillian student brought a novel dimension through quantitative analysis of indentured ships of 45,000 migrants who migrated to Fiji from North India. It is important to note here that the most of the scholarship and research on indentured immigration have been meager, qualitative as well as quantitative large major contribution lay in the detailed statistical the statistics he provided on the immigrants' social, economic, geographic and geographical background. In a sense, his detailed work elaborates on a theme explored by Gillian in the early 1960s. Lal convincingly, they punctured the myth that the recruiters were the scum of the earth, were low caste or low class or belonged exclusively to untouchable communities. Rather, the bulk of the recruiters reflected the actual distribution of caste in the villages of UP and Bihar. He further argued that colonial recruitment was a vast, well-organized operation and that the high percentage of cancelled license shows that it was difficult to defraud and deceive the people without detection. A high percentage of rejection on the ground of fitness by medical inspectors confirmed that, confirmed that there was in fact very little space for deception. Based on archival records, Lal rejected many of the certitudes of traditional historical writings. For instance, the stereotypical idea that indentured women were mostly astray or the loose and did not belong to a respectable caste. On the contrary, the agreement ticket shows that all of the females who came to Fiji consisted 4.1% Brahmin, 9% Kshatriyas, 3% Banyas, 0.3% Kayas, 31% Middle Caste, 29% Low Caste, 2.8% Tribals and 16% Muslims. In other words, the women immigrants came from entire spectrum of the caste in UP. 
In addition to his quantitative and archival research, Rizal tapped the experience of his Grimitia grandfather and conducted fieldwork in Grimitia's hinterland in UP to try and fathom the complex world of the peasants who agreed to board the Tahu bound ships. According to him, the endangered experience led to the creation of a new kind of society among Indian communities overseas. The progenies of the endangered Indians differed significantly <coughs> from their core. For various in terms of thought and behavioral patterns, world name and values, they were more individualistic and pragmatic, more self-oriented, more egalitarian, sometimes extravagantly proud of their ancestral cultural heritage but not enslaved by its rituals and cultural protocols. Brizdal's writings had an important impact on the endangered scholarship. In the 1980s and 1990s, the 1980s and 1990s saw a proliferation of works and theses on various aspects of endangered system, including some written by the grandchildren of Gilmitia. These included work by Vijay Naidu, Ahmad Ali, Rajendra Prasad on Fiji, Clem Sicharan, Vasudev Mamaru, Madhvi Kale on West Indies, Surendra Bhana, Ulam Wahed, Palpana Hiralal and others on South Africa and other scholarly works were by Don, uh, John D. Kelly on Fiji and Marina Carter on Mauritius. Where Bhana followed, following this class, explored the ship list to understand the composition of Indian indentured laborers to Natal their equipment district, caste, etc. Wahed brought up, Gulam Wahed brought up a new explored, uh, unexplored areas of endangered history in South Africa. Through these works, important things have emerged around the socio-economic conditions of the endangered migrants in both their home countries and coast countries. They have provided corrections to the Tinkerian approach through the quantitative analysis of data as well as by placing the agency of workers at the center of their analysis. Despite this, the question of whether indenture was comparable to slavery or that what extent it would be considered free labor has continued to dominate the debate. Madhuri Kale has analyzed the significance of the empire for indenture labor migration from India and argued that the British Guyana experience was a scandal of empire that galvanized anti-slavery forces to again protest the activities of British sugar interest. In her work on Mauritius, Marina Carter differentiated between slavery and indenture and argued that the emigrants were not merely passive players in the colonial drama. She analyzed the interaction of indentured laborers with Sardas and laid a good deal of emphasis on the strategies of labor mobilization by the government and planters. She focused on the returnees who played a significant role in labor mobilization and on Sardars as socio-cultural leaders of early indentured settlers in Mauritius. She has paid special attention to family, culture and religion as well as, as well in the plantation context and arguing that the indentured laborers restructured their social and religious life in the colony. Despite studies such as those by La Kale Carter that focus on agency and subjectivities of migrants themselves. Many scholars, including Prabhu Mahapatra and Gail Pomfet, continue to uphold the view propelled by a huge thinker. In these analyses, migrants are primarily regarded as victims of various forms of greed, deception, colonial coercion, and manipulation. The absence of freedom, these scholars argue, is the distinguishing character of endanger in as much as workers were unable to withdraw their labor power, bargain or renegotiate the terms of their contract to secure better wages and living conditions. By contrast, other scholars have suggested that migration entailed substantial economic, social and cultural benefits. According to P.C. Iman, a leading revisionist, the long distance migration stream under the government supervised indenture system was seen by many recruits as escape hatch through which they could break free from economic and social problems at home. 
He also argued that in nature emigration was usually the result of choice made by the intending emigrants by himself, albeit not always based on rational grounds. Crucially for him, the endangered system not only created homogeneity among the different caste groups, but made it possible for the lower caste to transcend oppressive, previously rigid socio-cultural parameters. In recent decades, a significant trend has emerged in the historiography of Indonesia towards looking at the experience of women. These are two broad approaches. There are two broad approaches. One portrays women under the Indonesia system as sorry sister, subject to sexual exploitation. A second approach highlights the possibilities created by Indonesia for women to escape socio-cultural oppression within Indian society. Rhoda Redder argues that while endangered women may, or quite possibly, have made the decision to travel to Trinidad to become workers, colonial plantation policies exploited them and made women dependent on men. On the other hand, Imar and Northrop state that for the first time the indentured system provided opportunity for Indian women oppressed by the patriarchal norms of Indian society. Marina Carter argues that Although the plantation experience was harsh for Indian women migrants, their role as contributors in public life was empowering in their struggle to overcome discrimination and inequalities, both in their personal relationships with male partners and families in relation to the colonial state. Similarly, Karpana Hiralal also explores the women's lives as endangered and free Indians in South Africa where she has where women had to fight with many patriarchal odds. Very recently, Gautra Bahadur, in her seminal work, Pooli Women, has reopened the debate on the treatment of women on the plantations. Through her family story and detailed exploration of the archives, including ship logs, Bahadur has contextualized her Kimitya's grandmother's history within the larger politics of the colonial migration policy, through which many women left their homeland to escape patriarchal oppression at home. In contrast to the earliest feminist analysis regarding endangered women, Bahadu considers that the phenomena of migration enabled the empowerment of women through their new ideas, quote unquote, coolies. That's why her book title is The Coolie Women. Through the story of her grandmother, Sujariya, Bahadu excavates the repressed history of Puli women among whom many were widows, outcasts, or runaways, who chose to emigrate alone to work on sugar plantations of Caribbean, Indian, and Pacific Islands. Bahadur shows that it was the sexuality that gave only women a degree of leverage. The scarcity of women on plantations provided them a sway, but at the same time, it also made them victims. Though the field of endangered studies have developed rapidly since 1970s, it was only from the late 1990s that works discussed above began to have an impact on teaching and research on the subject of Indian emigration history. Until relatively recently, Indian economic history during the colonial period was considered almost exclusively in context of the geographical space of the subcontinent. Pageants were a major focus of such studies, as long as, as long as the area of focus remained in India, whether in the villages or industrial town. On leaving India, so they seemingly forfeited their rights to the attention of Indian historians. It would indeed be fair to say that until the late 1990s, the issue of Indian migration was largely regarded as an Indian internal matter. Even in premier institutes in India. More recently, however, there has been a shift towards considering endangered migration overseas within the context of a bourgeoisie interest in diaspora studies. While McNeon, Adam McNeon's global history of 19th century migration lays little emphasis on the endangered, the work of Christine Bates and Marina Carter considers Indian histor historical overseas migration from the perspective of network. 
they argue that in contrast to the caribbean or pacific regions the proximity of indian ocean to india provided opportunities for extensive spouse and team regrouping and high level of circulation migration this understanding of a historic migration significantly complicates the colonial categories of slave indenture and free labor a migrant is one who leaves his village village in recent years labor historians have accepted the view that in order to develop a nuanced understanding of the working class it is essential to look beyond the realm of market economics and understand the religio cultural world they left behind which they reinvented or carried with them reflecting this change of the focus i devoted to understanding not understanding the indenture history not only uh, not only their economic lives but also the changing cultural worlds of the immigrants both in india and overseas while most studies have looked at the indenture laborers in relation to their destination points in my research i seek to focus my attention on the social world changing fortunes of those laborers from the point of origin and throughout the indenture experience and hence i consider immigrants not as lost of their original village but as individuals whose choices aspirations and lives overseas cannot be studied without also paying serious attention to their quotidian social cultural life in the villages of the gangetic plain so by applying a subaltern perspective to the study of indian migration throughout the indian ocean colonies i move beyond the simplistic for and against binaries and examine the degree to which individuals were able to renegotiate and change their status through social mobility and movement between categories of labor and how migrancy facilitated such slippage between ascribed identities and for that i studied the culture of migration in search of work and services over the long term here i explore the factors that would have been way before deciding to enroll for the work on distant sugar plantation a fundamental factor in understanding how indenture work perceived in the villages both by the men and by relatively fewer numbers of women who went or those women who remained behind as well as how it differed from previous experiences of labor mobility what i have found here that there had been a tradition of peasants migration in search of job since 15th century especially to get recruited as soldiers of shalkant army in india eastern hindustan popularly known as pura was an important area for the recruitment of peasant soldiers during 15th and 16th century under the sultanate of shershah and john these purabiya soldiers worked for their emperor at distant places during the mughal rule in india the same purabiya were in the army mughals recruited peasants at sepoy especially from the region of baksar from where i belong these soldiers were popularly known as baksariya when british east india company annexed large part of india it formed a huge army consisting of purabiya and baksariya peasant soldiers in many songs the separation of the husband from the wife is due to the nokri or service which in tradition traditional indian india generally refers to long distance service such as that in the british east india company army selvan was mentioning about the sources which i have used in my book and uh, is true that i have used so many you know oral sources not i mean oral in form of the songs and that depicts the separation of the husband the separation of husband from the wife and that's how how it happened because of the migration because we had a tradition of migration the above evidence clearly suggests that rural india especially in uttar pradesh and bihar is unimaginable without a constant outward stream of short term medium or long term migrant migrant laborers who are destined for service in the military commerce and agriculture <coughs> north indian peasants served in the army of the delhi sultanate and rendered their service to them for the 14th century they continued to serve in the british pantheon as sepoys despite their cultural and religious fears about crossing the black water the above account shows that peasants were constantly on the move looking for work or nokri 
the songs of separation confirms that indian peasants were seasonal migrants migrants who in the off crop season migrated to work for the distant masters in their trade or as sepoy in the army purabia and baksarya not only served in the sultanate and mughal armies but also got nokris in the british army and went away from their homes to serve their masters although the movement of peasants for nokri in pre colonial india was completely internal such internal migration for nokri made them to even travel beyond the sea during the colonial period so in a way migration was not a new phenomena for the indian peasants humanitarians and the anti society anti slavery society members and the late and the later dominant historiography contended that the peasants who were being transported to this sugar can field of the various islands were completely unaware about the place and the working conditions that's what even tinker argued the so called coolies were being fraudulently recruit, uh, recruited and most of the time kidnapped by the immigration agencies however when i was exploring and going through the various you know documents however minute details and evidences appear in the various official and non official writings indicating that there was considerable familiarity about the indenture emigration and the sugar colonies among the peasants in the mid 19th century as the peasants had developed their own vocabularies during overseas emigration under the indenture system because if you look to the different uh, official or non official report you will get new vocabularies during 19th century for instance arkati damara chinita mirich these were the new terminologies how it came if you look to the history of these terminologies then you will understand that peasant here knowing that what is it if it is becoming a part of the everyday life of the peasants then one cannot argue that they were not knowing where they are going if they were not knowing then how these new terminologies came for instance the word arkati from recruiter and mirich for mauritius were frequently used by the indenture workers who returned from mauritius after completing their contract these words were quite popular in united provinces in british bihar during the 1880s when major teacher and george grierson were interviewing peasants to understand their feelings and thought on the nature system both found that the destination point had already been conceptually presentized a hierarchy of preferencing also to have been established for example in up teacher noted that trinidad popularly known as chinita was preferred to damarera popularly known as damara or damarera jamaica was considered as good to go little was known yet in early 1883 of either fiji or meta this may be due to the late commencement of emigration in fiji in 1879 and at all in 1860 to mauritius popularly known as mirich was popular among north indian peasants peacher found that people were quite aware about condition of the system passes and wages in the colonies for instance Mauritius was preferred by the immigrants due to the shortness of the journey, inexpensive return passes, and payment of monthly wages instead of daily wages. Apart from that, migrants were in touch with their family members back home. The postal record shows that, although limited letters and remittances were being, although limited letters and remittances were uh, were being definitely sent. by the nature depressed from the colony in my book if you go through that i have shown some of the hindi not hindi some urdu letters as well as one in kathi that is a letter from uh, natal in 1870 something like so these let uh, these these are the proof that the half people were in contact with their family back home in india so luckily i got only two letters because <laughs> here you will only get the translated version not the original i also look into the journey of indenture workers on the high seas explores the new developments of shipping technology provisions of food medical facilities and other making of provisions and argues that 
the journey of indentured emigrants was much different than slave journey the colonial state tried to provide a much facility to emigrate to avoid any discrepancies in terms of provisioning and rescue the emigrants workers cultural and habitual life during their journey this certainly mitigated the suffering of long and tedious sea journeys one of the main concern of my research in this book has been to understand the migrants in the context of the village and village and the plantations my concern therefore is is a very much is very much with the labourers between their native villages their fields and culture and the plantations overseas in a sense i centrally focus on both culture and agriculture of the both world of gimitias and here my point of departure is simple culture is lived and reproduced in communities but is crucially tied to place and exigencies of work and labor how well did this culture travel typically of the bosphorus speaking in nature developers from eastern uttar pradesh and bihar on its way to south africa suriname mauritius and fiji scholarship even fiction has had much to say on the demise of caste both on board the ship and in the plantations and on the continu continuation of such public festivals it it has had relatively less little to say on the exact experience by the married women regarding the need to deliver a requisite male child or birth rituals or belief in particular caste or beast or hero to give some straight examples or was it the case that the bosphorus speaking emigrants that became south african mauritian or fijian gimitia were obliged to forget to borrow a key phrase from the celebrated essay of ernest renan on nationalism a large part of their present work related culture because now they were no longer peasants reading and sisly and manipulately the getty cloud formations in particular lunar ascetism to better decide the optical time of sowing and weeding their small land holdings was it the case that the since rations were now provided by the plantations their women no longer sang while grinding wheat flour dolphin song of jalsar about the eager wait of the brothers facing to their fallen martyr homes so in that way i tried to compare the culture in north indian villages the peasant culture of the north indian villages as well as the culture here in the plantations colony in india you know that india has been a multi crop society in one year we produce three four five kind of the crops so once these multi crops people come to the single crop or mono mono culture of production like only they have to uh, you know grow the sugar cane that culture which were very much associated with the different crops or the different you know festivals last year that was the main curiosity of my research and what i found that i compared the both popular culture and folk beliefs of gimitia besides it pay attention to the thickness of the colonial archives because you will not get much of the culture on the colonial archives because they are not they were not concerned about the culture of the peasants rather they were very much concerned about the work and the sugar besides it pays attention to the thickness of colonial archives on indian peasants and by contrast the thinness of the archives official and planters own on actual work and beliefs on the plantation in doing so i also engages it also engages historians experience difficulties with writing on plantation culture the problem with most recent attempt to relate the issue of culture to the plantation regime is that paradoxically we remain none the wiser about the work regime and calendrical unfolding of the agriculture regime of work of the gimitia in india we have the calendar of the work we don't know what was calendar here because they had to only grow the one crop so the process of production here and there is quite different all the plantation required a daily expenditure of labor as a matter of principle this must nevertheless have been linked to the agronomic needs of the cane plant as well as a linear period in the calendar calendar of the cultivation it is worth worth researching that what was the rhythm of the work process on the plantation plantation where for the cultivation of sugar cane did it still follow the agricultural seasons where after planting the seeds there is relatively little need of hard hard work for the raising 
the crop until it reaches maturity. Safe weeding and watering, or was it the case that the plantation regime transformed these peasants into working class labor, such that there were no more peasants who followed a socio-agricultural calendrical cycle for the cultivation of a variety of crops in India? On this point, the historiography of indenture is insufficient. The lack of any official reporting and cataloging of popular culture and process of sugarcane production in colonial plantations plantations was a basic characteristic of the plantation regime, such that once someone disembarked as a Grimitia, he she became lost from the official oversight, confined to a particular state, until he or she or a collective of a similar person become a problem of the planters and the colony. So what you will find that the only in nature or individual that in nature was coming when he was becoming a problem of administration of the colony. Otherwise they were not bothered about the enemy. So in the official report, this is the problem in the official reports that you will only get mentioning of indenture laborers when they created problem. So when ordinary does extraordinary thing, then he comes to the colonial life. That is the problem of the archives and colonial archives especially. The tricky issue of religion in an alien place aside, I argue that the indentured Indians did not simply forget the cultural practices of whom even in plantation regime created a disjunction between peasants' agriculture and popular culture of the village in United Provinces and Bihar. Now I look to the contemporary nationalist discourse while analyzing the role of the leading nationalist who campaigned for its evolution. I argue that the suffering of indentured Indians on the sugar plantations were not the core issue for the Indian nationalist in the beginning of the evolution campaign. So if you look to, look, look to the anti-indenture campaign in India, their concern was not the indentured laborers. That I have shown in my book. Rather, it was the issue of an political and economic rights of free passenger Indians in South Africa for which Indian nationalists such as Mahatma Gandhi, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, Madan Mohan Malviye were struggling. When they failed in fulfillment of their demand by South African government, Indian nationalists seem to have propped up the indentured problem as a point of bargain. It was only when Indian nationalists failed in their attempt that they started a campaign for the evolution of the indentured labor system altogether on the ground of degradation of position of Indian women on the sugar plantations. The indenture system involved the shipping out of a small peasants from North India. In our case, peasants who produced, raised, worried over all sorts of crop in addition to their valued sugar cane. When the shipments arrived, they were now, they were now to function as peace rate workers raising only cane crops, ration for their upkeep, upkeep of their bodies were not raised on peasant farms as was the case back home but provided by the planters. As for their soul, they did not quite set into the table as on some of the plantations of the South America. The Puraviya Grimitya, who had coined a new vocabulary for himself or herself, and his or her fellow Jahaji Bhai Jahaji Behen was not robbed entirely of his or her ingrained gangetic culture. On the plantations of South Africa, Mauritius or Fiji, he she lived it differently. Migrants may have left behind a lived past in the cane fields of the Gorakhpur, Shahaba, Banaras or Mutihari, and they may have vacated the cultural space of home and her, but they carried enough portable Bhospuri objects, taste and words to reproduce their own culture selves away from home as they labored and reinvented new and different futures for themselves thousands of miles away from the home. Hence I have attempted to provide an alternative account of the being and becoming both economic and socio-cultural of those who put their thumb impression on Girmit in Calcutta or Madras before embarking on their journey to distance and alien plantations, largely 
within but equally outside the overarching empire. This then is an attempt to write a history of the so-called coolies of the British Empire in as palpable a sense as the archives, both official and non-official, allow us. Hence, migration overseas under the indenture system was a continu continuation of their earlier of the earlier migration in search of work. Indian peasants had worked under an army of sultans during the Sultanate and Mughal period. Ujjainiyas of Gangetic Bihar were one such mobile peasants army deployed for sepoys in the ruler's army. Purabiya and Paksariya were peasants who served in the Mughal army and later in the British East India Company army. 18th and early 19th century North Indian experience experienced the internal migration of Indian peasants for employment in the East India Company's army or in the various growing industrial cities or in railroad construction. Entering into an agreement or gimmick to work across the seas in the Tatus or Sewer Islands was no doubt an absolutely noble venture, full of risk, but there were the enticement of a better life, which even when frequently unrealized made sense to patients, men and women who were already on the move. Soon after its introduction, the indenture system became popular in countryside. North Indian peasants conceptualized many new terminologies and means related to the indenture migration. These terminologies in various inquiries reports revealed a lot about the indenture system. They helped us conclude that the large sugar colonies and the working of the indenture system was quite known among the people in India and workers overseas. Returnees became a reliable source of information on the lives of indentured workers. Although economic reasons were an important factor in becoming a Grimitia, there were many other factors such as social and cultural operation of lower caste, deplorable conditions of widows, non-acceptance of inter-caste and inter-religious marriages, and a strict patriarchal household. The indenture system in many ways became a way to escape such socio-cultural separations. The ships were loaded with items relating to the migrants' cultural attire like dhoti, saris, and items for feminine, feminine jewels such as makeup, ornaments, tikuli, sindur, and more importantly, the ready stock of vermilion, a requisite for all married women to indicate their marital, as opposed to widow status. The provisions of food that were made reflected what the colonial officials and immigrants agents thought was fit for Indian laborers' consumption while providing a dietary space for contestation. Not only were laborers provided with some of their habitual foodstuffs, but their religious beliefs regarding food and its preparation were in several instances accommodated. However, some of their particular diet, dietary regimes in India based on caste distinction, where lower and upper caste cannot eat together, were disregarded on the board of the ship. This later disregard was perhaps the most crucial legacy of the experience of the journey, as it provided the ground where Indians for the first time could imagine a casteless space. Although crossing the, crossing the Kala Pani could be psychologically traumatic for many Grimitias, it also bound them together in a new, new relationship, such as, as Rizlal said, Jahazi Bhai or Jahazi Bhai, sheep brothers or sheep sister, considerably free from the caste prejudices. Massive literature was written by the grandchildren of indentured laborers from all over the colonies. Sometimes the indenture themselves wrote about their experiences on the plantation, which bring out the fact that though it was a hard work, hard work in the alien surroundings, the plantation regime did allow them a space where they lived their life in their ways. This was free from some of the abominable features, and there are a good many of the, these of the Indian social structure. 
somehow these intending Gritias realized that it was better for them to board the ship for plantation as paid workers than be employed as force, force, lab, force laborer as the behest of the landlords or to be tied in local variants of aggressive servitude in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, the main catchment area of the sugar colonies and immigrants. The experience of many Girmitiyas such as Baba Ramchand, Tota Ram Sanadhyay and Munsi Rahman Khan shows that Girmitiyas realized once again the betterment that was offered to them by the indenture system when they came back to their native country. When they came back to their native country after their tenure in the plantation, they found that most of their fortunes was lost at the hand of their own teeth and teeth. They had to undergo the operation routines of, to reclaim their place in the respective caste with payment of fines and organizing feasts for village, villagers. This was imposed by caste assemblies on the indentured laborers. If you look to the uh, memoirs of Tataram Sanandya Bhavaram Chandra as well as Munsi Raman Khan, we will discuss in detail what happened when uh, uh, Tataram Sanandya and Ram Chandra returned back to the home. The socio-cultural life they lived on the plantations was not an exact plantation culture, sans roots, nor was it completely Indian. Girmitia may have left their past behind in the ten fields of the native plains. They may have vacated the cultural space of home and her, of sacred rivers and nearby tea and asthans, holy sites, but they had carried enough of portable Kashmiri culture with them to be able to reproduce their cultural selves away from the home. Girmitias did not follow the lead of the Indian nationalists to mount the criticism of the system. There is good evidence to show that Girmit system and Girmitias were not of the real concern of the elite Indian nationalists, mindful of their status and caste considerations. They were more concerned about the political and economic rights of commercial trade in Indian communities in the British colonies, and especially in South Africa. The Girmit system was seen by them to be abominable only when they did not get any of these rights. To stand for evolution of the indentured system by these Elitist Indian nationalist was mere retaliation in the face of failure to, su to successfully bargain for the political economic rights of trading communities in the colony, especially in Natal. While paying attention to the economic, social and cultural backgrounds of Grimitias in their own district, in my research I have refrained from the limiting itself within the parameters of the commercial agency. What needs re reiterating is that the entire Dimitya saga, from the Gangetic hinterland to the sugar plantations of Natal, British Guyana, and Fiji, or Suriname, was underwritten by the overwearing and enabling structure of the British Empire. For it was because our Bhojpuri peasants were the subject of this far flung empire that they could be shepherded all the way from the village of Baharais, Baksar. Banaras or Burakpur in the Gangetic hinterland with the sugar plantations on either side of the road. It would be truism to say that it was the lines, both administrative and shipping, that connected the hinterland of North India to the clay plantation, cane plantations in the Indian, Indian Ocean, South Africa, the Pacific, and New World. Equally, it was this very great, the Kunti cries in Fiji, symbolizes the sexual exploitation of Indian women, Grimitia, by white supervisors and the ex exertion of the barrister Gandhi against the tenting of the all Indians with the tented Prasa Puliju. Because when he was uh, thrown out from the train, he was said, you, you are also good. Tented brush of the Pulichute and subsequently against the system itself that brought about sufficient nationalist pressure in India, both inside and outside the legislative council, by uniting diverse problems of the Grimitias into a pan-Indian national grievance, something which led to the 
colonial Indian officials to, to acquiesce to abolish it in principle in 1970. Concomitantly, it was because India, the brightest dweller, jewel, jewel in the crown, could be factored into supplying the labor requirements post emancipation in other parts of the British Empire. The colonial state in India could, so to speak, generously provide its labor from Gangetic hinterland to the sugar colonies, such as Suriname or French reunion outside the empire proper. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Because uh, 
uh, you know, at that time, uh, you know, uh, even before reaching the uh, Indians in the Fiji, Indians in Fiji, uh, there was a negotiation that the all lands rights would be in the hand of the Fijian chiefs. So they are facing the different problem. In Suriname, in other parts of the, uh, I think, other colonies, they have integration and they have the problem of race. In Fiji, you will not find the problem of race, whether it is the problem of rights. So, here as well, you are facing the problem of race. So, in that way, you know, each colony uh, you know, uh, has different, different situations in problems. I think uh, those who are working on post indenture problems, they will get more you know, insights on that race and Ashutosh, maybe just three comments, or th one comment and two questions. Let's go to the questions first. So the first question is, what is the present condition of the peasants, the villages, from where we came, right? Uh, PR and 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 Madras. So you know, a lot of the rural villages from the from the films that we get speak about Adivasi, speak about tribal villages, and it shows a real poor condition. Yeah. in India itself. So that's, what is that condition? The second, the second question was that, in Tinker's book, there's a term, Bega, you were speaking about yeah. marriage and so on and so forth. What are the, the Sahan and Madras? So I want to know what are the, what are, what are the terms in the south of India? What, is, is there any evidence of some of the terms from the south uh, peasants and, and Madras specifically? I know that you know the literature is very skewed towards the north of India uh, in terms of indention. South, in South yeah, in South Africa, through two thirds majority. Like for example, the letters that we spoke about on email. Right. Those Tamil letters are non-existent. In fact, in the archives, I picked up just one uh, that was written in Tamil. So I'm asking then in the archives, are there more examples of those letters in Madras? Okay. So, are those the things that are still available there? Thank you, Mr. Uh, well, I mean, the Indian countryside is, even today, their conditions are not good. Though, I mean, it always depends on our politics and reforms. Uh, after independence, definitely we had the, you know, the land reforms, uh, as well as Chamindari revolution and many other uh, economy reforms happened. But the peasantry is still poor. If you go to the UP and Bihar villages, their houses are still of mud. So even to, that's why Prislal is arguing that we are far better than uh, our ancestors uh, or our uh, you know families members back home in India because they they are living in you know same conditions and situations. And even if you will go to Delhi, you will see the same. See, I mean. It's been more than 100 years of evolution of the Indian Chamber. But the conditions of peasantry in North India or South Indian villages are same. Uh, looking to the, I mean, the letters, this is very important. I only couldn't get letters from your archives here in Karnataka. But I have found many letters from Suriname archives, from Fijian archives, ample, ample letters from Malaysian archives. And all these letters are not only in, Hindi, in all Indian languages. So, for instance, I got letters in Urdu, I got letters in Tamil, in Malay, Malayali, as well as in Bengali, as well as in Bhojpuri. And this is a Kathri letter, that is a form of the Bhojpuri. But it is really difficult to find out. So, for that, one needs to have a student's mind that how to find out letters from the archival, you know, uh, material. It is difficult, but definitely I have found many letters. And my next book, which I am bringing, is on the letters of indentured workers. Because then that, through that one can tell the story of indentures. I mean, these are the, their own voices. If you look to the letters written in their own languages, then, and if you look, I mean, if you, you know, go, deep into those letters and compare the word which has been noted down in the letter and then look to your village words, then you can understand that yes, it is a genuine letter. 
This is also a big, pro big problem to understand whether the letter is genuine or not, or somebody has written in their own ways. So that is why these translated letters, I mean, I don't trust fully on the translated letters. But once I read the Indian languages letter, then I can understand whether this is a true word or not. And what I found that the, those letters which I found from Fiji and Suriname, they are written in a Bhojpuri, Bhojpuri language, and these are true words which has been used by the nature, I mean the peasant in the villages. So that's how I trust that this is the voice of the Indian journal, rather than the voice of the writer or translator. Because, you know, Professor uh, Vaid is speaking about the future of uh, study with Indian There's many gaps in yeah. South Africa. One of those gaps is that you have uh, oral testimony with Totaram, Munshi, uh, Ramachandra. Uh, we have with Bhavani Daya. Uh, yeah. But that's he more specifically with repatriation by the 1931. I am speaking specifically about those letters and the personal experience. We, we've searched long and hard in Durban. I wonder whether it exists in Natal. Other directions of indigenous study could involve, you know, tales and oral testimony of the Akartis, specifically in Natal, because, and also, maybe diary accounts or maybe personal things because I imagine some of them would have been fairly rich and so would have come from families yeah. where their records would be. So I think this is the direction that we need to be yeah, pushed that, to. Yeah, but those I letters think, are sad. I think you know the people should explore on that. There might be some letters with some family members. For instance, I'm like so in Suriname I got like some letters from the family members. They have kept. They given me even I do have some family members are in the Netherlands, they given me some letters written in around 1931, something like that, but these, these are still important letters. So it means that they were in continuous contact with their family back home in India. The only problem with Indian archives is that you will not get such letters in Indian archives. Because, uh, uh, because once I mean, those who are sending letters to India, and if it, it, it didn't reach, it come to the dead letter box here back to the country, by, by, back to the uh, Suriname, Natal, yeah. So those letters are in the colony, uh, in the colonies archives rather than in, in India. That's what I found in Fiji. Uh, there is one letter in my book which was written by someone, and he wrote to, he misspelled something. And that's why they, Baba Ramchand, you know, written a letter to the governor that you should appoint a very good, uh, you know, well-known uh, clerk so that he can write the, uh, write the name of the district. So, even in writing, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, you wrote some different spellings and the postman would not recognize it, then he returned it back. That happened, and that's how we picked. I picked many letters from this that it was in the dead letter box. So I just checked and found interesting letters there. So there are many ways, but I haven't found any letter, any letter in India. I've almost seen the each and every files of the government of India immigration department. I didn't cross any letter. In fact, we don't. I mean, it's very surprising that. Where are our ship list or our certificates? Because there was one certificate in Calcutta or Madras and one with the ship and one with the indentured. So where are these two other certificates? The Calcutta has no any certificates. Uh, Madras has no any certificates. Where are these certificates? Also the ship registers. Only we have one, one Natal ship register in, uh, which Professor Bhana has explored. That register is there, only one. One ship to Natal, that's all. But in the local archives, sometimes we find uh, you know, some uh, names of indentured laborers who uh, went and some who returned. For instance, I got many such, uh, such register in Banaras uh, local archives that is now shifted to the Lucknow archives. These registers are now shifted. So we have around 30 registers of all colonies, but these are not the full registers. 
so maybe there is gap. But these are variable source. Yeah. in terms of the archival records, you know, of Indian workers and even passenger Indians, for example, who live in India. So there's a great deal written in the former colonies on their arrival to the, to, to, to the diasporic, uh, you know, the regions where they went to, but so little information from, uh, for example, from where they are, from where they left. So, like, when, for example, in Natal, we have the Indian immigration papers of Natal a rich archival source. But just to the point that you alluded to in India, as you said, there's very few shipping lists because I've always wondered, um, perhaps we need to cast our you know, research across uh, the Indian Ocean and try to, for example, um, explore uh, their conditions in India and perhaps trying to gain access to those records. Because surely when they lived, you know, Madras or Calcutta or or Mumbai, or Bombay, or Portland, or whatever, there has to be yes. some kind of record keeping, right? A, a, a ship list, or even, for example, when the, the recruiting methods, is there no available information about recruiting methods when they were held at the depots? Any description about, you know, how they were housed in these depots? Uh, what were their conditions? I've always wondered, you know, um, is there any kind of, um, archival information or any information or records around these issues because I tried and I wasn't very successful. Yeah. No, I mean, right. this is surprising for me even because every time I, I don't know about that, I mean, around two or three times I visited uh, this uh, UP estate archives and Banaras uh, local archives. Suddenly I got some registers. So maybe one idea is to visit all the local archives trying to find out what kind of material they do have. So, <laughs> that one needs to be, because in the national archives, because in the national archives, you will not be. We have digitized each and every files of the immigration department. Now you can see here. So there is nothing in the national? There is no. Only we have one register. That's why I am saying, I think we should explore the regional archives. And maybe we can get better material in the regional archives than the national archives of India because that are the high level files. And if you go down, down, down to the local level, then you will get more and more important information on the, uh, on the, on the system and functioning of the system and the recruits. So, uh, so that can be a very good uh, uh, source so to write the materials. Bhavani Jayal's yeah. paper that speaks about the Madras House, yeah. those attachments. Surely there will be documentation uh, and that would have been in place. It's that, that house still exists on the on Google uh, sort of map. But I'm sure there must be documents. There surely must be in terms of housekeeping, what was done. Yeah, because that would be Yeah. He's right. Actually, he did an effort to meet some Pravasi born in Sasana because he was from my neighboring area. I'm from the same <laughs> location. The Bhavani there was from the Sasana. And he tried to, you know, make some libraries, archives. He's writing in his book of 1931 publication that how he visited that place and he even met the many Indian uh, 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 Congress leaders. But the only problem is that uh, he was not successful at that time. Because uh, in 1932, Banasida Chaturvedi and C.F. Andrews were working, uh, you know, collecting reports, uh, you know, from uh, uh, Fiji or, or returnees uh, at Calcutta. So that report is still with us. But after that, we have no any other material. But it would be definitely, definitely a good idea to visit because in Indian local archives, I know there will be material. Like in Banaras, which I got many, uh, you know, registers, big registers, like this size. So the names, year, age, etc., etc., all this information which one should talk should have. Are there? Because I think sometimes, I think, you know, to understand the whole history of Indian it's not only 
the point of arrival in terms of the damage, but it's also the point of departure. Right, only when it's out in my impression. I have that is I should from the origin point, that is yeah. a, another way. Yeah, well, you should come and we can go to the other place. Thank you. 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 Thank we often think we are riding a crest, and then you, know, you often realize we've missed the wave. Uh, and it connects with the question that of ready waves, you know, you just talked about Uganda and so on. And just because of being a geographer and using my geography lens, I think one of the areas where the indented research needs attention uh, is there's a need for more comparative studies. You know, whether it's uh, you know, South Africa, Mauritius, Caribbean. And I know Brisbane, to the end of his life, was trying to do a bit of it. And uh, you and the Crispin Bates project, I see some of that there. I see it in Nilesh Bose's work as well. Uh, so it's beginning to happen, but I still think we are in silos. Uh, you know, no one is crossing it. I mean, even with various respect to Kalpana and Golan, you know, someone is being indentured uh, in and someone is being traded, you know. They're kind of, there's a meeting point mm -hmm. somewhere. And, and if you look at Uganda, Uganda was a mixture of traders and mm -hmm. there were laborers. You know, they, it's often under yeah, yeah. because of the economic dominance of the East African traders, uh, the, the laborers are almost invisible. So I think if we, and, and what comparative work does is you join from what already exists. And, and you know, I escape, and I'm not an archivist, as Blum knows, he's laughing. Uh, <laughs> it, it requires a certain tenacity to, 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 to do what Blum and Calvin and Ashwin and yourself are doing. Uh, but sometimes you, you go for the low hanging fruit. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I fully agree with you. I fully agree with you. Because whenever I read something, Gulam comes with a new idea. So, <laughs> in the recently he got from Sultan Khan. And so, all the time I think, oh, why I did not choose this? <laughs> something like that. So, it also depends on what kind of material while you are exploring, what kind of untouched material you find in the archives. And then you can write something new. So, for instance, I got many Indian languages letters. That was a fascinating material because we had earlier the translated kind of the position, depositions, right, and letters. But suddenly, if somebody is, you know, find out some, you know, original sources written in Hindustani or uh, other Indian languages, so that might be an interesting and important source to write alternative history of Indian So, in that way, yeah, it's it's always depends. And uh, comparative study is really needed because even in PC when we are there, everybody was discussing about the comparative study of indenture in different colonies, like British as well as non-British, Europe, other European colonies, French, Dutch, or uh, British. Yeah. Professor Kumar, you can see that the historians are looking for more archives, <laughs> more records, <laughs> so they can continue their research. That is their business, and I think it's quite legitimate. Uh, just a couple of comments in closing. You know, we are focused very much on the adventure and so on. People were mentioning during the discourse here, there is also another stream of passenger Indians, which we probably neglected. And maybe it's time so that we should consider a workshop of their contribution, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to indenture and, and so on. The second thing is that, you know, we also in this country are focused very much on the indenture from India to South Africa. You have brought a new dimension, because taking us across to Mauritius, to Fiji, to Trinidad, and to Suriname, and I think that you've given a wider context that and you compare some of the differences and similarities. 
For that, we are very grateful in the for what you've done. And yesterday, your colleague has brought to our attention some of the implications of the current Indian diaspora and, you know, in the United States. And we have seen, you know, the implications that has where they're taking off some of the CEOs of, you know, much big multinational companies there. And, and thank you very much indeed, you know, for your coming to the country and for the contribution you make. And I hope you will continue your work in the future. And I'm sure there will be occasion for future protection. Have a good stay in this country and a safe return.